All right, well, Placemakers is the series. Hospitality is the topic that we're talking about today. And I got to say, I am very excited to be able to be the one to talk with you about this because this, this topic and this series in general really hits kind of close to home for my family and I when I consider sort of the last handful of years that we have experienced. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain why and I'll explain how it connects to our reading for today uh, in just a bit. But I thought I'd do that by kind of giving you a little bit of a life update because the last time that I was standing here, uh, I was the vicar. And that was, that was only two years ago, not even two years ago, really. And in some ways, that feels like yesterday. But in other ways, uh, given all of the sort of life events that have happened for my family and I between then and now, it feels like a lifetime ago. And so sort of a life update to tell you how this placemaker's idea really resonates with us. See, for a, a number of years, uh, my wife and I, we were preparing to go to seminary. Basically, since the beginning of our marriage, we always knew that it was going to happen. And during that time of our lives, we really felt, well, we kind of felt a little bit nomadic in a way. We had a number of years where we lived here in the Twin Cities before we went to seminary that we were always like not doing like big life moves, not buying a house and not getting a dog or things like that because we knew eventually we're going to go to seminary, right? And we don't want to have to sort of deal with all of this stuff when we have to pack up our lives and move. And so eventually in our lives that day came, we packed up our stuff and we went to seminary. This was a terrible idea uh, to try to move like this. That was about, you can see about 18 different straps and millions of bungee cords and a tarp that was shredded before we hit Rochester. Um, so needless to say, we learned from this experience, which is a good thing because we were only in St. Louis for two years when we learned that we were coming back here to Woodbury to be able to be the vicar here. And so we packed up our stuff. We got a truck this time, we learned, I said. We packed up our stuff yet again, and we moved, headed north back to Minnesota. And we were here for a year, and we loved it, and it was a great experience. But we had to go back to St. Louis to finish seminary. And so, as you can maybe guess, we packed up all of our stuff again. This was about an hour after the last time I was preaching here. We got a truck again, and then the next day, a bunch of cool people came over and helped us pack up that truck and we moved back down to St. Louis for our final year of seminary. And we were there for a year, and we, you know, finished up school and everything. And then graduation came. And I graduated. Two days later, we had a baby. Two weeks later, we were doing this. You can guess. Packing up the truck <laughs> and moving back. We moved back up to Minnesota. We settled in Arden Hills. We bought a house. We start, I started a new job. And for some reason, this also feels like worth mentioning in all of these things. We also bought a minivan. Now, this is before it was completely trashed. Um, and this is really just an excuse for me to throw this picture of my kid up on the screen, if I'm being honest with you. Needless to say, we had a number of years in the last handful of years where we felt we, we went through a lot of sort of transition periods a number of years where we were constantly moving and traveling and going back and forth. And that's why this Placemaker series really hits home for us. Because I can't tell you how many times during that sort of nomadic period of our lives, my wife and I had the conversations along the lines of, man, how great is it going to be when we can finally just like stop moving? How great is it going to be when we can finally, you know, set down roots, when we can kind of like make a home together? How great is it going to be when we aren't in one place for, or where we get to be in one place for more than like a year or two at a time? How great is it going to be when we finally have a place, right? And as I was reading and sort of preparing for this message uh, this week, I couldn't help but wonder if Abraham and his wife had similar conversations in their life. Not necessarily because of our reading, but because of what happens before our reading. If you know about Abraham's story, you know that he had sort of a nomadic period to his life. He was called out of his, out of his home country, out of his land, away from his family, by God, to go to the land of Canaan. And so Abraham does just that. He packs up all of his stuff and he heads for the land of Canaan. 
But when he gets to Canaan, he doesn't just like settle down. He travels around in the land of Canaan as far as Shechem, it says. And I don't know exactly where that is, but it was as far as Shechem, I guess. So he travels as far as Shechem. He's trying to find a place. He's still traveling around. He's still trying to look for something. And just at that time, a famine sweeps over the land of Canaan. And so he and, and his entire family, they have to pack up and move to Egypt. And they spend a couple of years sojourning in Egypt while they wait for the famine to get better, better in Canaan. And then finally, when they are able to leave Egypt and they're headed towards the land of Canaan, even then, it doesn't go automatically. It says they travel in stages towards the land of Bethel. They go along stage by stage until finally, finally, a chapter and a half Later, after God had called him out of the land of Haran, and a number of years of Abraham's life later, they're finally able to settle down in the land of Canaan. Middle of chapter 13, God calls him at the beginning of chapter 12. And that really struck me as I was looking at this this week, as I was thinking about this. Like, what's the deal with that? Why does God call him out of his homeland at the beginning of 12 and not place him down in his place, in the place that God created, uh, created for him, called him to, the place that God made for Abraham until a whole chapter and a half and a number of years later? I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I, I'm going to be clear about that. I don't know why God put Abraham through that. But if nothing else, this would have taught Abraham how to be and how to show hospitality. You look really unimpressed. <laughs> and that's okay. You're like, what's the big deal with hospitality, right? And that's because in our culture, it's a very different situation than Abraham's culture, right? In our culture, we pay for hospitality. You want a place to stay? You pay for it. The more you, you're willing to spend, the more hospitality you're going to get. And so I'm going to give you a scenario just to kind of to, to illustrate the difference between our culture and Abraham's culture. Let's say you're on a road trip and you're driving along the interstate and it's getting kind of late, it's getting kind of dark, and you decide you're not going to drive all night. I'm going to pull off and I'm going to find a place to sleep. You can answer this question. Where, what, what's the first thing you look for when you pull off the interstate? A hotel, Right? You're going to go and find a place that's made for this, a place that you can pay someone to stay at. Let me give you a different scenario. Same scenario, just slightly changed. What if, same scenario, you're driving along on your road trip and you pull off on the interstate and instead of looking for a hotel, you just went and found the first random neighborhood you could find. And then you pulled into that neighborhood and you found the first house you could find and you parked in the driveway and you went up and you knocked on the door and asked that person, hey, can I stay with you for the night? What's the response? Not great. Where are you staying? Probably not there. Probably in like jail for the night or something like that. I mean, you're probably getting the, call, the cops called on you. But put yourself, now same scenario, but put yourself on the other end of answering that door. When somebody comes to your house, are you letting them in? Or are you calling the cops? I know where I fall, right? But in Abraham's day, this, this would have been the expectation. In Abraham's time, this was how you traveled. You didn't go and find hotels. You went, and, and when travelers came to your door, you were expected to bring them in, to care for them, to provide them shelter, give them a place to stay. And even more than that, to provide them food, to care for their most basic needs, to protect them even. Travelers in Abraham's time, they were held as sacred. And that paints this, this beautiful picture for us of how Abraham acts in our reading. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to chapter 18 or you can pull it out on your phone, your apps. But if you look at that, look at this, this hospitality that Abraham shows in our reading, it, it's incredible. Look at this. It says, it says that Abraham sees these three men. He's sitting in his tent. He sees these three men and he runs out to greet them. He doesn't just like sit at the tent and sort of half-heartedly and eye roll like, yeah, come on over and, and stay here, I guess, right? And he doesn't do what I would probably do, which is, oh, is that my phone ringing? I'm going to go in. Hopefully they didn't see me, right? No, he jumps up and he runs out to actually go and greet them. And then he like begs them to stay with them. 
please stay with me, he says. Take a break, take a load off. And then when they agree, he doesn't just like go get some scraps from the pantry. He goes and he tells Sarah, start getting your best flour. Make some bread. And he runs out and he gets this fine calf that he has and he prepares it with yogurt and, and with milk and roasted meat. And I'm getting hungry just like reading this. Abraham is like pulling out all the stops. I mean, this guy's going for the five-star Airbnb rating, right? Abraham knows how to do hospitality, and here's why I think this is. Now, this is just me guessing. I think this is because Abraham had had so much experience traveling, being the traveler, and experiencing hospitality that he really knew how to give hospitality, how to show hospitality. Abraham had so much experience receiving love as a stranger that when strangers came to him, he was able to show them that same love. And when we look at biblical hospitality, that is what we see. Hospitality in the Bible is literally the love of strangers. Isn't that a cool definition? I love that definition. And it's good that Abraham was good at loving these strangers, especially when you come to learn who these strangers most likely were. Many biblical scholars think that one of these men that was there is what we call a theophany or a Christophany, which is a big fancy church word to say that this is like pre-incarnate Jesus there in his tent. And so if you can wrap your head around this, this is Jesus that Abraham is showing hospitality to. This is God putting himself in the care of Abraham, which is really incredibly mind-blowingly cool. It's also really terrifying, right? Because Abraham was ready for that pop quiz, right? When Jesus says that whatever you do for the least of me, you do, uh, the least of these, you do for me, like Abraham rocked that thing, right? But what about us? Like, do you start to think that question, when has this maybe happened to us? And I, I know this is maybe sounding far-fetched or crazy or something along those lines. What did they teach him at the last year of seminary? I know, but read our second reading for today. It sort of alludes to this, right? It says, it says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some of you who have done this have entertained angels without even realizing it. This is what scripture calls us to. And whether or not that we have the, uh, uh, a, a incarnation of, of Jesus or angels that we're, actually, that we're actually showing hospitality to and showing love to, Jesus says it's the same. Whatever you have done to the least of, me, of these, you have done to me. And so friends, this is what we're called to do is to, ha to show hospitality to others. But I love how this is framed because it, it shows sort of both ends of the spectrum of this hospitality situation, right? On the first hand, it says, do not forget. This is like, you know, mom reminding you before you go to school, listen to Miss Johnson today, right? This is that kind of a thing. Don't forget, which means don't be so wrapped up in yourself. Don't be so busy. So, don't be so worried about your own finances or well-being or something along those lines that you are forgetting to show love to strangers, but I'm going to push this further. I would say that hospitality is, is a muscle that needs to be stretched. Love like this is a muscle that needs to be stretched and, and to be exercised. And so the way that we'll push this or challenge this is what are ways that we're actually putting ourselves into situations where we can show hospitality? What are ways that we're not just having our eyes and ears opened to it, but we're actually putting ourselves in situations where we can actually show this, right? And, and so, like, does it look like inviting over a, a U of M student for Thanksgiving dinner? Maybe it looks like next time you're on your lunch break and you're walking by a, downtown by a homeless person and instead of dropping a couple dollars in their cup, instead picking them up and saying, hey, why don't you come with me and let's go eat lunch together? Go to Subway and share a sandwich with them, right? Uh, maybe it looks like hosting a foreign exchange student for a year. Or if we could be really, really out there, maybe it looks like fostering a child. 
right? All of these ways, I don't know how they would happen. I don't know how they would go for us. But if we did this, one thing I can guarantee, we will not be forgetting to show hospitality. But the other thing that I love is the other end of the spectrum, which this verse shows, which is to say that it celebrates that we have already done this as well. It says, some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Some of us have already shown hospitality in this way. Some of us have already shown biblical hospitality in this way. And one of the best examples that I can think of of this uh, was from the testimony that Michael Tome did for us a couple of weeks ago here. And so we have another clip from that video that I want you to see. Take a well, look. it's interesting you mentioned placemakers because um, two, two verses come to mind. I'll get to your, to your question on the dinner table. But the first verse that comes to mind is that, is that Romans uh, 8.15. On, uh, no longer no longer consider you outsiders or slaves but um, but adopted children you know God I know what that feels like um, and I think all of us can can appreciate that love from God right through other people through his spirit that just I love you because you're you for any other reason right and and sometimes that unconditional love looks in looks like a lot of different things but but it's still unconditional um, so, so that's one of them. And then the other one, you know, in John, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And Jesus, that's what he's done. And I think my mom um, was really, both my parents, uh, placemakers for other people, for me, for my brothers and sisters, uh, for our friends, where like, you know, we didn't even have to be home. <laughs> but our friends are welcome at the table, right? I, I love that. That last line that he says, we don't even have to be home and our friends are welcome at the table. How great is that? I mean, I love that. And, and, but the best part about what he does here is that he roots it in scripture. He, he doesn't just say, yeah, they were really welcoming people, but he says that, that the thing that spurred them on to, to be welcoming like this, to be hospitable like this, was actually scripture. And f- friends, that's what we're called to do. That's what we are called, where we're called to look as our example. Ultimately, we look to Scripture as our example of hospitality, and, and the best example is, obviously, it's Jesus, right? And so as I, as I was sitting again with this hospitality idea and looking through the gospel, preparing for this message, it sort of shocked me to realize how often Jesus actually talks about and practices and shows hospitality throughout the gospels. Like, when you look at it through this lens, it just jumps off the page all over the place. Probably the most obvious example uh, comes from Luke chapter 7, which is uh, this scene where Jesus is at the house of Simon the Pharisee. And this sinful woman comes to anoint Jesus. And Simon the Pharisee kind of is like, man, if he knew who she was and what she had done, he wouldn't be letting her do that. But Jesus uses that thinking and that mentality to teach Simon about hospitality, not about judgment, not about uh, thinking of others less than yourself, but about hospitality. It says, look at this woman kneeling here, and he's talking to Simon here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them. He continues to say, you didn't greet me with a kiss, and you neglected me the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Obviously, hospitality matters to Jesus. And yet he often didn't receive hospitality at all. Look at his life. He is born in a stable, in a manger, because there's no room for him in the inn. His hometown kicks him out, drives him out because of when, uh, when he reveals who he is, because of who he said he is. He says of himself, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was despised and rejected and bruised and beaten by the very people that he came to save. And yet, even though he faced often more hostility than he faced hospitality, Jesus still chose hospitality every time. You want proof of this? You look at his miracles, just his miracles alone. His very first one, turning water into wine, showing hospitality, like blatant hospitality at this wedding. Look at the time that he fed 5,000 people. It says he looked out at the crowds and he had compassion for them and he feeds them. What about the time that he healed the lepers and the blind and the lame and the mute, which were 
numerous throughout the Gospels. These are him bringing these outcasts of society and giving them their most basic needs so that they could be welcomed back into society. And how about this? Raising the dead. If that's not caring for your most basic need, if that's not next level care, love for the stranger, I don't know what is. But friends, the ultimate example that he shows of hospitality in the face of hostility comes on the night in which he was betrayed. Because on that night, hours before he would, he would walk up the hill of Calvary to the cross, he gets up from the table and shows his disciples unexpected hospitality. And he kneels down and washes their feet, just like Abraham showed hospitality in our reading. But what he does next is elevates hospitality beyond a level that any of us could do. Because he gets up from washing their feet and he offers them a meal. And it's a simple meal, bread and wine. But it's a lavish meal. And it's the most expensive meal that you could possibly imagine because he says of this meal, this is my body and this is my blood. And he says to his disciples, and it's given for you. And in just a few hours, Jesus would do exactly that. He would, he would climb the hill and he would give his very body and his very blood for the most basic needs of all humanity for the sake of brokenness and sin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the meal that we surround ourselves, or we surround today. We come together and we eat this bread and we drink this cup. And when we do, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we get together and eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the hospitality of Jesus until he comes. When we get together and eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the insurmountable, unsurpassable love of Jesus that he showed to you and to me who were once strangers, who were once far off, but who now have had a place made for us. And so today, that's my invitation for you. Come forward and eat this bread and drink this cup and receive the hospitality which Jesus has given to you. And then here's my challenge for you. Take that hospitality which you will receive here today and be like Abraham. Go out into a world which so desperately needs love, a world full of strangers who might show you hostility and love them anyway. Show them hospitality in incredibly unexpected ways. Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray for you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us a way, that you have shown hospitality in such incredibly unexpected and unpredictable ways. And I pray, Father, that we would not lose sight of that, that we would not lose hold of that, that we would not simply come and receive this meal and, and, and go on living our lives as if we had not received this incredible love. But I pray that we instead would be changed. We instead would be, would be equipped and ready to go and leave this place and show hospitality, to love the stranger just in the same way that you have once loved us. Father, equip us in that as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.